Okay, so uh, we will call this meeting to order at uh, 4 37 p.m. And um, I guess we should do an official roll call. Melanie, please. Uh, Barb Franco. Uh, mute Barb. Here, Melanie. Thank you. Skip Keith Kaiser. Here. Richard Beck. Here. Kevin Brooks. Present. Jason Gramlick is absent. Joe Barwick and Scott Warren. Joe, um, Joe, I think if you go to Napa 2010, I think that may be Jill. Yeah, I've been trying to promote them, but they keep declining. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Hey, Melanie, I think you might, if you look in your record, you might have their telephone numbers if you do and want to send them a text or if somebody else has. I know, Kevin, you probably have Jason's, but I don't know if anyone has Jill's. I have Jason's. Uh, let me send him a text. I thought, I thought you were going to send everybody these phone numbers at one point. Isn't that what they decided? Didn't we discuss that a couple couple of meetings ago? Yeah, we did. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Mel. I thought we had. Yeah, I was just going to say that. I, I thought we had sent everybody who was willing to share their telephone number. I don't know if there was anybody that was unwilling, though. Melanie I, I coordinated don't, I don't that. Think I, got a, I don't think I got on that list. Okay, we'll reshare it again. Thank you. Um, Kelly, this is Carlos. Do We have four members currently, right? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I thought we needed five for a quorum. Do I only need no, four? No, no, no. We have a quorum if we have four. The bylaws because... say majority of the committee, so... Wonderful. Okay, great. What Thank we you. Need to uh, conduct business and do all that stuff. Wonderful. Okay. Um, so we have. Hmm, I don't have Jill's number. Okay. All right. Well, we'll just carry. Oh, but I'm here. Oh, I've been here. Nobody can hear me. <laughs> oh. Welcome, Jill. Okay. I didn't so now want we to have. Go ahead, Jill. Sorry. I was going to say, I kept, I didn't, I wanted to be an attendee, not a panelist. Oh. But it kept, it didn't like that either. You have to be a panelist, Jill. You can't be an attendee. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, with that, we have five of the seven and definitely a quorum. And we have called the meeting to order. We have completed the roll call. Uh, the agenda is before us. Uh, does anyone have any comments on the agenda? If not, um, if we could have a motion to accept the agenda, please. Yeah, I'll, I'll move to accept the agenda. Thank you. I'll second. And I'll second. Thank you, Richard and Jill. All in favor? Okay. Yes, I. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. The agenda is accepted. Uh, next order of business, the approval of the minutes from our, I believe it was a July meeting. Um, yeah, I'll go ahead and pull those up on the screen. Just, I, I mean, they were in your folder, but just in case. Yeah. In case anyone wants to look at them again. Uh, I'm just scrolling to the second page because that's where the meet is. <laughs> Right, so July, it was a July 21st meeting. Correct. correct. Okay. Right. Yes, I read them. Just let me know when you want to scroll or if you guys are ready. I, I read it. Any comments on the um, meeting minutes from the meeting in July, folks? No. <clears throat> okay. All right. If there's no comments, then do we have a motion to approve the minutes? Uh, yeah, I'll do that again, Kevin. Mm. Okay. And I'll, and I'll second again. <laughs> Okay. Keep, it, keep it rolling, Kevin. Keep it rolling. You guys are okay. making Melanie's note taking life very easy. All right. Uh, with that, uh, we have a, a motion to approve the minutes. All in favor? Aye. 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 
Any opposed? Okay, with that, the motion to approve the minutes passes. What, what day was that meeting? It was uh, July 21st. Why, why are we the first Wednesday instead of the, instead of the third Wednesday? We... The uh, July meeting was an anomaly because there was a uh, vacation. Oh, right, 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 right. Okay. And things like that. My memory's not good anymore, Kevin. Sorry. I, I'm here to cover you, Richard. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, uh, with that, I do we have any members of the public present? We do not. Okay, then we will skip uh, reading the preamble on that. And we will move on to item number five, uh, which is review of expenditures. So um, for today, uh, folks, we wanted to do a deep dive on uh, Napa Junction project expenditures. Um, similar to what we've done in the past where we've picked a campus or a project on a campus and, and uh, you know, focused our attention on the various expenditures in that category. And then we also wanted to look at the um, status of the overall uh, spend on the bond measure as well. So with that, uh, Kelly et al, we will turn it over to you. Thank you very much. So um, before we go into the encumbrance report, which was also included in your folder for the meeting, um, I also just wanted to point out, remind the committee of um, the total allocation in the current budget for Napa Junction Elementary's uh, new campus. So um, currently, the, it, this comes from a board item where the action was happening that evening. So the proposed UIP for 2021 is the um, is the approved amount? You can see that um, forty nine point one two five million comes from Measure H, and all the way over to the right, you can see that um, one million dollars comes from Fund Forty. Fund Forty um, is held for, um, uh, for lack of a better term, I'll call it. It's a miscellaneous fund for capital improvement. In this case, it is a million-dollar donation from the Vintners, um, who donated that money to support the Family Resource Center, which is a space in the new Napa Junction Elementary School. It's a space that is in many of our campuses, um, and just helps support parents and community members. So that million dollars went into the pot. Um, for the project, but the um, purview of your committee is the 49.1 million um, allocated from Measure H. Any questions on that before I get into the encumbrance? No. All right. All right, each of you also got a copy of this. Um, this is a list of all of the encumbrances for the Napa Junction Elementary School project. Uh, just to be clear, um, an encumbrance is a commitment to a vendor um, for the cost of a given good or service. So this means that these are POs that have been issued for the project. This money is spoken for. It may not have all been paid out yet, um, because services may not necessarily be complete. If it's a good, maybe it's not completely delivered. There's a number of reasons. Um, you know, as you all know, we pay contractors and architects and many vendors in increments. Um, so if you see a balance, that's the balance between what we have committed to pay them for the project and what we have paid them as of the end of the fiscal year, which was June 30th. Kelly, did, do we have to, did they have to pay for that property? Yes. Is that what the $10 million is? Yes. So they, they bought that property for ten million one hundred eighty one thousand. Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. And that includes all the parties. Okay. So yeah, who, and, and Richard, that was done before. That was done before um, Kelly and myself, Rosanna, came on board. That was done uh, prior previous administration. Was that still? But did Major H pay for that? Yes. Yes. Hmm. But, but did. did 
but you were here for Measure H all the way along, haven't you been? Is that, is that, am I no, I can't. No, we both came on board um, when Measure H was already uh, full. Well, I want to say full throttle, but it was definitely already moving forward. We came in in 20 uh, June. Well, Kelly came in, I think, in May, April of 2018. And yeah. I came in in July 1st of 2018 and was on a started on July 1st of 2018. And, and they had already bought the property. Or Correct. Who did yep. you buy it from? You know? Is this, uh, they bought it from a private owner. I, I don't know the name. I'm sure we could research it and find out. Yeah, it's just, but just they bought it from not from. It was not some public place before that they. No, it was not. It was a private. It was a private homeowner or private property owner. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, back to you, Kelly. Yeah, the uh, list is available. I really just kind of wanted to open it up for um, the committee. If they have any questions about any of these vendors or expenditures, I'm happy to entertain those questions. I don't know um, who, if anyone got a chance to look at it ahead of time. Um, obviously, the big ticket items are there. Lathrop Construction is our contractor. ATI Architects and Engineers is the architect. The other big expenditure I was going to point out, obviously, was the procurement of the property. Um, and then there are also contracts for um, inspection services, the purchase of um, equipment and furnishings for the new school. Um, so those are some of the highlights. But I, I'm happy if you have curiosities about any of these vendors, I can give you some more information. They, they had planned to buy this property then before prop, prop, uh, the, before Major H had even passed then. Could not comment on that, Richard. I know that <laughs> I know that they wanted to, um, I knew they, they wanted, they, we had to relocate the campus, but I couldn't comment if they already had a piece of property in mind in discussions part of that. I have no knowledge of that. Okay. So uh, Kelly, this is, I guess you would call, a, I would, what I would call a commitment status report, right? So this is based on committed monies or what you call encumbered monies by vendor, mm -hmm. correct? Okay. And I'm assuming that Keystone also has what I would call a job cost statement where you could see, you could drill down into uh, Lathrop, right? And see all their monthly draws yes. that total the 33 385 920 yes um but lathrop's contract and their lease lease back agreement um is a little bit unique to a typical payment draw that you would see with a contractor because uh, the way their agreement reads they're doing regular interval payments so for the course of the project they were paid in equal intervals so um don't quote me on this and i can look it up and let the committee know but i believe it's 1.9 million they were paid monthly um, over the life of the project. Um, and the only change in that would be um, in the event of change orders, obviously, then that those payments would be different. But um, generally speaking, it was equal amounts until you get to the end of their payment period. And then it turns into a finance payment that is drawn out even longer during the course of the project as part of the lease lease back agreement. So they're always paid in fairly equal intervals. Okay, so what, so for in that, since we're on that topic, and anyone jump in here, don't want to monopolize the conversation, but in, since we're on that topic, what does a typical pay application from Lathrop look like? Is it just 100% complete at, or, you know, payment X out of a total of Y times the monthly increment? You know, it was an interesting challenge um, due to the way their agreement was set up. So we ended up still reviewing a schedule of values with the contractor because it just honestly felt like the right thing to do to keep everyone honest. So they still submitted an SOV, even though their payments were in intervals. And for those of you who don't speak contractor ease, um, the uh, schedule of values is a list on a contractor's pay application, and I'd be happy to show the committee if they've ever want if they ever want to go into that kind of detail. But it shows all of the different vendors and subcontractors that are associated with the project and their percentage of the total contract. Um, and it is something that's typically reviewed monthly with the pay application. It's a way for us to make sure that the contractor doesn't get out ahead of us asking for more money than they're owed. Um, but this one, as I said, was a little bit unique. Does it also, does it also tell it that the subcontractors have been paid? Yeah, so in order to get paid, they still have to do conditional and unconditional waivers. And again, for the folks uh, who uh, need a little bit of information on that, um, a, a 
condition an unconditional waiver basically tells the uh, tells the uh, district that the contractor agrees. Uh, that they were paid for last month's payment and that they are whole. And a conditional waiver says, if you pay me what I'm asking for this month, I agree that I'm whole for this month, which is a total oversimplification, but it's a basic idea of, of what it is. So it basically is a sign off that we all agree that we've paid the right amounts. But do, do, no, not just you, but there's a famous builder uh, that was notorious for not paying his subcontractors. And, and are we sure that the subcontractor has been paid? We oh, are, and believe me, I hear it when the subcontractors don't get paid. Uh, subcontractors also provide conditionals and unconditionals, um, and they also have the mechanism of pre-leaning the job, and many, many of the vendors um, that worked on this project pre-leaned. Um, and again, I'll give a little context. A uh, pre-lean okay. is when... Um, you give notice to all the involved parties that you have made an investment in the project that you're committed for a certain amount of money. And if you're not paid, there are consequences to those involved. Um, and so that paperwork is filed with a number of the vendors as well. So again, trying trying to keep it simple, but. So do you ever make the, the checks payable to the contractor and the subcontractor? <laughs> Kevin's laughing because he knows that game too. Uh, that uh, you can do that, but it is highly inadvisable. Um, it is not something that, that I like doing is making splitting checks. Um, I, I just don't, I, I, I really think it's important as a district to respect the relationship between the general contractor and the subcontractor. And there are many reasons a subcontractor may not be getting paid as quickly as they would like um, that may have nothing to do with the district. So we wanna put pressure on our general contractors that they pay their subs in a very timely manner, but we also wanna bring them in and have that discussion because the contractual relationship for the district is with their general contractor. Um, and so we just want to be careful of how we navigate a split check um, is really when there is no other recourse and you have not a very good general contractor. I'll, I'll throw my two cents there if I could. So um, we would we would joint check. Uh, well, in our case, right, we would joint check a subcontractor and a sub tier. If uh, there's evidence that the sub tier for example is not being paid or if there that if there's a lien that's been filed on the mm -hmm. property mm -hmm. but it's a whole kettle of fish and it's worthy of more than five minutes of discussion um but jill that's an excellent question kelly the assumption is that you guys have a system in place to check that you have all the unconditionals for the previous month before you release release payment for the subsequent month right exactly that is the, the short story on it. And before it gets to the point where somebody is asking um, for a split check or they are asking for um, you, you know, some sort of restitution, normally there's a number of phone calls that are made to the district. People are talking, we're talking with our general contractor and we're trying to you know, resolve that issue with the subcontractor in the easiest way possible that doesn't make us go down that road. And normally we can. I, there's only a handful of times in the 20 years I've been doing this where we even had to do something that drastic. Okay. Um, Kelly, the uh, the categories, is that, I mean, so if we wanted to look at this by categories, right? Because again, key analytics, you know, the report can do everything, include making a latte for you. Is that what the description ID is? Yeah, I mean, some of them, as you can see, are pretty darn general, but yes, you can sort by description. But are they, are there other category codes that go with the vendors or go with, you know, are the, are the vendors sorted into standardized category codes? So there's a couple different ways. This is just a brief description of the vendor for the layperson to understand generally what that vendor did. Um, as far as the school, um, the school district's accounting system, that's called the SACS code, and that drills down fairly detailed on the type of vendor, um, it's called the object code, and then also sometimes splits between um, a contractor's pay application and their retention, and it can get very, very detailed how it's tracked in the district accounting software. Um, and this software also tracks it that way. But okay. this is just so that, you know, the, the public can understand what each vendor is doing on the job in a basic way. 
So let me let me ask the question differently, right? So you have I'm assuming you have a a permitting code, right? All the costs associated with, you know, I'm I'm, I'm assuming you have like six codes ish, right? Permitting, land acquisition. No, we have several more than six, but yeah, yeah, there's quite a few. Um, but so for instance, for permitting, like there, there would be one that's, you know, like agency having jurisdiction. You can see that a few times. There's an object code for that. Um, and, and items like that, what might be different than the object code you would use for a contractor versus one you would use for an architect versus one you would use for a inspector, let's say. All of those are different. Okay. So aside from if 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 ob, so object code is the most most detailed uh, categorization of invoices or costs, right? Is there a higher level summary? Do you have different layers of codes? So um, the next then the next layer up would be the um, the management code and the site code. So the management code tells us what kind of a it's basically imagine it like a project number. There's a management code to the Napa Junction Elementary School project. And then there is a code for that specific site, which comes into more play like let's say you're doing campus modernization. Um, in that case, you know, you have a campus mod and you have multiple sites. So it's coded by the type of project and then it's coded by the site. In this case, uh, we have one project at a single site. So it's doesn't, it doesn't make a difference. So on this, uh, you know, so this is a two page commitment report. How many, how many object codes would there be? For the, what we're I can't here? answer that question off the top of my head. I'm, I'm sorry. I could certainly look into it and get back to you. Okay. But I mean, just, is it, is it 10? Is it 20? Any it's probably idea? like 10. Okay. Okay. And uh, based on your experience is the, you know, percentage uh, breakdown of costs average, typical. So in other words, if you, if you said your construction costs are, let, let's just say it's Lathrop, right? Let's say it's thirty-three point five million over forty-nine million. Is that a is that a typical breakdown or ratio of costs? Yeah, it's actually pretty good. But my recommendation is when you're looking at that ratio of costs that you pull out the purchase of the property because that's not a typical cost for a given construction project. When we're doing our you know industry standard breakdown it's very rare that you have to buy such a large piece of property as part of your project so this one is a bit of an outlier in that way so if you're going to ask yourself you know how are we doing as far as percentages i would definitely yank that 10 million out and and then look at how it shakes out if that makes sense okay and we went over i think last time we went over change orders right so mm -hmm. this is this is a lease lease back Right, which is analogous to a GMP, GMP. So best value selection, contractor involved upfront with the design team and the owner in a collaborative environment. Um, were there any change orders on this project? There were change orders on this project. Um, I can pull up a change order if you like. Um, it has been around I want to say that we're around 2% on change orders right now. And, um, but I can double check that number. Okay. And presumably these were all owner initiated changes? They're either owner initiated or unforeseen. And what was the contingency that uh, Lathrop had in their contract? Lathrop carried 5% contingency. Okay, and what was the owner's contingency? Um, we carry 5% as well, but that also includes contingency that we would spend on other vendors, emergency services, things like that. So it doesn't just yep. con cover the contract. Right, 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 right. Okay, and this was a new build, right? Yes, it was. Okay. That's... Um... I would take 5% contingency, okay. And just uh, to be clear, um, all of the contractor contingency and um, 
what the what we might use on the owner side, we are still in negotiations closing out the job with Lathrop, um, you know, finalizing PCOs and costs like that. So um, that is something that's still happening right now. But um, their allowance, their 5% for change orders that are in their contract is in the number you're seeing here. Okay. And what would you expect the... Um... What would you expect the typical uh, AE fee to be on a project like this with DSC or DSA? Sorry, wrong jurisdiction. Um, the architectural fee on a project like this can vary between um, a really low fee would be around 8% and a um, fee on the higher end would be 12 and change maybe. Okay. And we're, at, we're about... 10%, so we're right in the middle, if I did my math right, okay. All right, does anybody have any other questions? And it doesn't necessarily have to be about Lathrop or ATI, if you see anything on the report that you're curious what they are, just let me know. I assume the fencing, the ABLE fencing was uh, permanent fencing? It is, yeah. Um, Able Fencing um, is a vendor that we use for a lot of our projects, and there was um, an area at the campus that needed some additional fencing, um, and rather than put that in a change order and muddy the waters while Lathrop was trying to complete it, we did a contract with Able Fence to provide um, railing and fencing in some additional areas. And save the GC's markup. Yeah, exactly. And then your... Um... IT budget is separate. I'm assuming that's the audio visual AV line. Um, so the audio visual, uh, that was the um, system that was put in the multi-purpose room and that isn't covered under the tech bond that's covered in our allocation here. Oh, right, right, right. Mm -hmm. okay, that's part it. of the construction okay. project. That would be, so structured cabling, that would be under infrastructure and structured cabling type stuff would be under the, under, under this um, cost center, right? It wouldn't be part of yeah, wow. everything, everything infrastructure wise that was put in this project was put in under measure H um, and that audio visual that you're looking at on the list is just um, infrastructure was put in at the at the multi purpose room, and then this is a system that is procured to be used in the multi purpose room. Um, Kelly mm -hmm. Kevin, I just yep. want to do a time check just to. Um, I mean, really good conversation, but um, we started a little bit late and um, there's 40 minutes that is allocated for this section and we're at five o'clock. And so um, this would, this, if we go the whole 40 minutes, we're gonna finish this uh, section at fi around 520 mm -hmm. with other items remaining on the agenda. So I just wanted to give you guys a time check. Okay. Can Very I, good. I have a question, Kelly. Uh, is, is water included in this? I mean, is that for, is that the American Canyon uh, City of fees? I mean, to hook up the water. Um, the City of American Canyon um, charges us to hook up during construction to their recycled water. Um, at there's a hydrant there. There was a charge for that. I believe there's two charges here for City of American Canyon. There's also yeah. a permitting approval costs in there as well, um, and items like that. But 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 somebody someplace or other you have to get water to the school. I mean, so where is, the, is that is that one of these? Um, we're already tied in to water. We have not paid a new fee. I know that that is part of discussions that happen outside the project with uh, Mike and Rob and the city. Okay. So I can't can't speak much to that one. Uh, do they have water? Yes. <laughs> Mike, if you're talking to us, you're on mute. Water, there you go. Water, sewer, and recycled water, Richard, is all on site. Yeah, is, that, is that part is there a fee here for it is it is, is it as, as kelly said we're in a negotiation with the city for those connection fees very good okay that was the root of the question right richard yes that was the root of the question thank you okay okay um anybody else have any other questions or any other requests for additional information 
Well, I'll scroll down to the bottom of that screen so I can see it the rest of the way down. Just real quick. Thank you, by the way. No problem. Good afternoon, Jason. Jason? Good afternoon. Almost evening. Or, well, now it's five o'clock. It is evening. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I got nothing on that. Thank you. Is 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 this guy David Vargas the guy that Leon's always complaining about? Always having the same appraiser? I believe so. I don't know a lot about that, but I know David Vargas does a lot of appraising for the district in the past. Um, the appraisal for this property happened a, a few years ago. So. Okay. Um, why don't we move on to? Um, if there's no other questions, why don't we move on to the? summary uh, allocations and overall bond monies remaining? Yeah, so there was a request. Um, oh, I'm not in present mode. Sorry about that. There we go. Um, there was a request uh, to look at just a quick high level glimpse of um, where we are at as far as the Measure H funds. Um, so just wanted to give you a high level view um, of our um, total measure each funds, how much is encumbered and how much is unencumbered. So um, I know we spoke a little bit earlier about encumbrances, but just a um, quick reminder on encumbrance. Um, encumbrance is committed funds to a vendor. So the difference I wanna make clear here is the difference between budget and encumbrance. So um, a budget, in the, um, like an example would be at American Canyon Middle School at the New Student Commons. We have 16 million and change budgeted for the project. We have encumbered something like 14 million and change. The difference between those two um, is that I, those are vendors I have committed written POs to that money is spoken for. I have the rest of the money for the project budgeted. For instance, it's not time to buy lunch tables for the new multi-purpose room yet. So I have a budget for furnishings, um, but I have not encumbered that money, haven't written a PO to a vendor and ordered tables yet. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that we were clear on the difference between budget, the entire Measure H, um, amount of funding is budgeted. It's just not all encumbered yet. But as you can see from this graph, a great deal of it is. And what uh, what's the as of what date is this ish? Um, this one is as of the fiscal year end as well, I believe is when I ran the report. OK, so as of June 30th, there was 5% remaining of the 274 total? Yes, 5% unencumbered. Right. Not, not in a PM. Not commit, right, not committed, right? Mm -hmm. So that's about $12 million. And um, what is the time frame for spending down the remaining? So that, that's $12 million remaining Measure H plus other funds, right? No, that's this is just Measure H. This this report is designed for CBOC, so this is this is just the funding for Measure H. Okay. Well, how much is on top of that in other funds? Well, um, in our other funds, we have approximately about about twenty million, some of which has been encumbered and some which hasn't, um, which is outside the bond. So that'll fund other upcoming projects. No, I, I understand that, right? But the overall capital program includes those monies, right? And the overall execution or utilization of those funds gets spent concurrently with the Measure H monies. Or are you going to spend down the Measure H monies and then close the bond and then the remaining monies get spent in a period outside of Measure H? You know, it's actually a little bit of both. Um, so we are spending down both for lack of a better term, buckets of money at the same time. We will spend down the bond likely before we spend down the remaining money in Fund 40, um, but we will be spending them. Sometimes there's projects that are funded by both, so like our campus mod projects, and then there are some projects that are going to go on to be completely funded out of Fund 40. Okay. All right, and uh, 
do you have an idea of so what um what's the roughly the total of fund 40 or the other funds i'm just trying to so if 269 is the bond fund there's another what 20 million or i guess it's 274 with interest right it's 274 with interest, yeah. And um, the other funds are around 20 million. I, I'm sorry, you have to forgive me. I, I was very focused on measure H for CBOC. So I didn't prepare information on the fund balances outside of measure H. Yeah, well, from our measure H 2021 implementation plan, it looked like there was at the time four and a half million, million. In, uh, four, yeah, four and a half million for um, fund 25 and roughly 16 million in fund 35 for it's a little bit over $20 million. Um, there is some, there is some uh, fund 40, um, but um, that was the million dollars that the, uh, the Ed Foundation, uh, no, they, excuse me, the Vintners had donated. And then there's a, a we, we do not have the property sale of the vintage farm yet, but that's something we, we showed on the report, but the sale of the property has not occurred uh, so there was only a million dollars in there. And that money, as Kelly already shared, had, has been uh, allocated towards the Napa Junction project. And then, uh, Mike, if I could just add in there, too. So as, as we get releases on that property, it's going into Fund 42. So part, part of the sale of the farm, the non, when they release a non-refundable portion of it, uh, it's, it's deposited in the property account also. Thank you, Rob. So um, I guess asked a different way, when, when, are, when, is, when is the the Measure H, what's the timeline for the Measure H uh, funds being exhausted? So um, I can speak briefly to the remainder of the funds that has to do with the capital improvement. A good chunk of that 5% remaining is technology. Um, so I don't know, Rob, if you're even prepared to talk about that yet, but I'll give you a second to talk yeah, about no, my first. Yeah, I'm, I'm not prepared to, to talk about the final plan, but yeah, you know, there's a little bit of shifting. So um, we we have had some other resources that we didn't anticipate being able to the, that we can spend on technology. So that's caused kind of a shifting to some of the priorities on the technology portion of the bond. So an example of that would be devices. So devices, as you know, are part of the expenditure plan for the bond for the technology component. And so with COVID, there have been these buckets of money that we have we've had access to where we've been able to spend COVID money to buy devices instead of bond money. And so what we're trying to do is, again, any opportunity that we have to spend uh, other buckets of money, we're trying to do that also. So COVID-related money, being able to use to purchase devices, we're doing that. And there's, there's other uh, potential money that we're getting to um, through the Universal Access Fund to provide devices for students to keep at home. And so with that said, there's some shifting going on um, in terms of uh, the technology portion of the bond that we, we need to kind of wait for all those kind of plates to stop spinning in terms of where we allocate for projects before we come up with the final timeline. And then as far as the, um, the hard, for lack of a better term, the hard construction portion of the bond, um, our, our portion of that 5% remaining will probably be spent down in the next calendar year from here and through next summer. So no, would Kelly, you, would you, oh, no, I'm sorry, go ahead, Kevin. I was gonna say, do you anticipate that the bond will be expended by the, before the end of the next, of the coming fiscal year? Um, I don't think so because I know that Rob and his IT team have um, have plans for projects that they're working on. And as I said, the 5% that I'm showing here includes um, a good deal of their tech bond that still hasn't been spent down yet. Um, but I'm, I'm just speaking to the construction related portion, a small amount of money on fencing, um, a small amount of money remaining on um, the American Canyon Student Commons project. Um, so we're talking about, you know, a million here, $500,000 there. Um, we're getting down on the construction side to a very small amount of money to spend down in the next year. And um, don't quote me on this, but I believe, Rob, the technology side has something like $8 million in change left to spend. That sounds about right. Yeah. Of the $12 million. Mm -hmm. So as right. you can see, to... oh, go ahead. No, just kind of jump in. So for us, so it would not be this calendar year or this fiscal year, I should say. So most likely it would go within 
um, the, the following fiscal year. But again, we're waiting for some, there's some other, you know, infrastructure like items that we would like to be able to fund if that's possible or waiting to see what happens with the devices. And so again, an example of this would be, we had anticipated um, at the beginning of COVID back in uh, March of 2020, spending about $1.5 million of bond money on devices but when that's the how the original PO was written um, on the day that we closed schools. But you know, after after that happened, we had access to COVID related dollars. And so we journaled that to COVID related money instead of bond money. So yeah, we're 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 trying to make use of all funds possible. Right. It makes just sense, like right? You're... Just like yeah, you guys are using some of some of the other facilities related funds, the property funds. Mm -hmm. We're having you know, suddenly have access to COVID related funds. And they, they have a shorter time frame, and so we're spending those first. So some of those funds had to be spent within a year or a year and a half. And so when you have a really tight time frame, you always spend, you know, we consider that a more restricted dollar. So our goal is to always spend the most restricted dollar first. Rob, is that is that you are you talking about some of that $25 million that was in the paper the other day that, that the school got for yep. COVID? Some of that yep. money. Um, exactly. No, it makes complete sense, right? You want to. You want to hold, you want to save your bond funds to the extent you can, right? But you had already spent yep. that bond money. Had I mean, you you already bought the, the devices. Am I correct? Yeah, but you you have the you have the ability to journal the expense exactly. and change the expense. And so I I think the way we actually took it to the board at that time because we were wondering. So mm -hmm. it could have been, it most likely said um, bond funds or COVID related funds. To kind of give us flexibility and so again if, if that money didn't fall you know in the beginning of covid you didn't really know there were lots of talks of these different funds coming and then when they land they land heavy they say by the way here's a million dollars and you know again this is a little bit of an extreme example but you have you know the next eight months to spend it hurry up go oh. so you know with a long list of things that are eligible okay um, Kelly, I assume this is the only slide on this topic. It, it well, I have I have one more actually. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Kevin, let me just give you a quick time check. Yep, I know we're almost out of time on this topic. Yeah, because we have still a pretty uh, some lengthy items to continue to get through. So. Yep, wanna... we got two minutes. All right, back to you, Kelly. All right. So um, in the past, in the last meeting, there was also a question that got brought up about expenditures by fiscal year. Um, so mm -hmm. it, it came up in light of the discussion about the CM fees and we saw the fee, CM fee um, going from fiscal year 18, 19 and then going downward and somebody asked the question about well what did expenditures for measure H look like, and so I created this graph I have the smaller graph there from the July meeting just to some context for what we talked about. Um, but you can see, um, this is how much was expended each fiscal year during the course of the bond. Um, and to give some clarity, we've talked recently about encumbrance and budget. Expenditure, again, is different. Expenditure is money out the door, checks written. So um, it's a little bit different than encumbrance. I may encumber, um, for instance, a contract with Arns Builders for American Canyon Student Commons, just to say with that same example, for $14 million. Um, but I have only paid them two. That's cash out the door. Um, and the reason why that's more relevant with fiscal year spending is because it shows um, you folks and the public how much work we're, we're running for lack of a better term. It's showing you what's happening. And so at that peak at 18, 19 and start of the start of 1920, you're, there's lots of action in the bond. Checks are getting written, projects are getting built out and um, it's a good indication of activity on sites um, that are building. So just wanted to give you guys that context. And the management fees are, that's um, uh, that's you guys, right? That's not district or is that total? Uh, no, the question at the last meeting was about our contract. So that uh, graph represents our contract, Van Pelt Construction Services. Okay. That was what we reviewed at the last meeting. Okay. Uh, any questions from the committee? on this or anything related to uh, item six on the agenda for today?
Okay. All right. Uh, we can follow up if anybody has any requests for any supplemental information. We can follow up on that later. All right. Uh, let's move on to item number seven, which is project updates. Yeah. So I'll start us off and Kelly and I are going to tag team on this and we'll try to go through this fairly quickly, see if we can make up some of the time. So we just wanted to give the, the, the CBOC members and I um, an update of the project at, at Napa Junction Elementary School. As you can see, this is an aerial view of the, the, the current site and how it's transformed into arguably one of our more beautiful campuses we have um, and has a spectacular view from the corner of Wetlands Edge. Um, and eucalyptus of the wetlands area, as well as on a clear day, you can actually see all the way out to Mount Tamalpais. And I've been told you can see the um, Salesforce building if you really look hard uh, from, from the corner there. I have not seen it yet, but uh, I'm, I'm gonna look for it. Um, you can see there's approximately uh, three acres of grass and then a large playground uh, area. There's an area divided for a, a upper grades and lower grades. Uh, the upper grades are, um, are in closer to the wetlands edge area on the west side and the primary grades are located on the east side of the, of the playground site. And then there's an interior playground structure for our kindergarten uh, classes as well too on that. And then um, surrounding there's another, you know, highlight of this campus is just the increased amount of parking that's here compared to the other, other school site. Um, and we are really delighted to share with you after about a week. It took us a little bit of a week, which is actually record time because usually we've been going on two weeks. Um, traffic flow uh, is, is really improved dramatically at this particular site. Um, and uh, the parents and everybody seem to have got it. And it's so the, the traffic study we had and the way they were supposed to enter the campus, exit the campus, uh, things like that is really working uh, well on that. So we can go to the, the next slide, um, give you another angle. This is, uh, again, this is the cornerstone of the, of the, of the project. We're at the corner. Um, uh, we're looking at, uh, north at this point, but this particular sign faces basically, uh, um, I guess it would be south, kind of southwest, um, but it would be at the corner of Eucalyptus and Wetlands Edge um, where the flagpole is and the entrance to the campus is located. And this is a primary entrance for the students um, into the campus. Next slide. So this gives you an idea on the right hand side as you enter if, if you'd gone through that entrance that we just showed you in the last slide you would run into this little seating area so it's a nice little area for the students to sit. Um, and then the, as you can look in the distance there that goes to the interior of the campus and then the slide to the left gives you a close up of what the interior of the campus looks and you can see that we um, have a, a some very nice grass areas for students as well as seating areas benches along there. Um, and then in the distance, there's some other areas for students if they want to do some outdoor work, but the teachers want them to go out and work in, in groups. Um, and then what you're seeing uh, in the distance there are the classrooms um, that start with the upper grades. And then as you proceed, go east in the campus, um, the grade level goes down from fourth to third to second to first. Kelly, anything to add on that? Mike, is that, is that hill the one where they want to build the apartments on? On the other side, you are correct, Mr. Beck. Back across here, okay. Yep. Uh, yeah, the only thing I was going to add is that little circle. So in the first week, we were actually at the site a lot, and we saw a lot of students and teachers in that little circular area. One of the fun things about it is those plants attract tons of honeybees, hummingbirds, and butterflies everywhere in that circle. You can count more than two or three of each at any given moment. So kind of a fun thing for the elementary school kids to be out there and see the hummingbirds and the butterflies flying around. All right, next slide. So upper left hand um, corner is a picture of the out exterior of the multi-purpose room. And then the other pictures in this slide represent uh, portions of that of the multi-purpose room. So on the bottom left hand side is where the students are eating with the tables uh, out. On the middle slide is the finishing kitchen um, that exists at this site. And this, this slide to the right is the stage um, that has been placed in this building, along with curtains and some lighting. And um, uh, I think it was mentioned earlier, some video equipment um, for this interior portion of the multi-purpose room. Um, multi-purpose room has, um, I don't know what exactly call it, Kelly, but they have light, you know, a, a good amount of daylighting um, on the top, um, which really helps, uh, you know, in energy efficiency, um, just really gives, and it gives a building a really warm feel um, inside. Uh, so yeah, anything to add, Kelly? Not on that one. Okay, let's go to the next one, please. Library. So the library is directly adjacent to the multi-purpose room. Um, and this library is approximately three times bigger, if not more bigger than their, than their current library that they had on site. Um, as this is a, this is a facing, this is, this is a shot that we going east 
um, but you can imagine there's just amount of, almost the same amount of size of the library um, behind the students uh, that are sitting there um, uh, at, in the library. Anything to add, Kelly? Um, in that area that you don't see, I would say that there's also enough seating for a class so that they can both do like a story time style like they're doing right now, or they can sit at tables if they have a project or things to do as well. So it kind of serves two purposes. Okay, and then here's a, a view of, of the classrooms, um, uh, some of the classrooms here. On the left-hand side is, I believe it looks like, yeah, it's just one of just a, a standard classroom you find in first grade, second grade, third grade, or fourth grade. And correct me if I'm wrong, Kelly, because I'm looking for, I'm looking for a restroom. Oh no, it does have a restroom in there. So is that the STC classroom? Yeah, it is actually the one. Okay. I'm sorry, I had my left and right swapped when you were talking about it. The one on the left with all of the colors is an SDC classroom, and the one on the right is a standard, like you said, um, you know, mid elementary school classroom. What does in, SDC stand for? Uh, special SDC? special day class. So any of our students that qualify for okay. yeah, sorry, SDC special day class. So, um, and the, one of the distinguishing characteristics is would be that this room has a bathroom inside the, the has a restroom inside the room, whereas a standard classroom would not have a, a restroom inside the classroom, with the exception of kindergarten rooms. All right, let's go to the next slide. And then I shared some of the highlights um, when I was doing the aerial, but you can see on the left hand side, um, there's a did a really nice job of, of with the playground and using multiple colors to really give it a rich, vibrant uh, feel and exciting field and, and we've had nothing but extremely huge compliments, um, not only on the, in, the entire campus, but, but, you know, but also with the um, playground as well. Um, the structure that you see, the playground structure on the bottom is the lower playground, lower grade playground structure, I believe. Um, and then on the right side, right hand side is the, uh, is the office. So as you walk into the office, this is what you would see um, from the, the reception area where the secretaries sit. And then the offices um, to the straight ahead and there's offices off to the right as well too. Um, the slide on the upper upper right hand side that has the, the picnic tables, that is an area that I re referenced where students can come out and they, they can use it for multiple reasons, multiple purposes, but if, but in particular teachers were very excited about having the opportunity to send kids out to work on a project since this is a project based learning school um, that they could send them out, have them at these tables right outside their, their classrooms, and then they can move back inside very easily uh, for that. Um, and then we gave you a picture of the backpack hooks um, and uh, believe it or not, you can, you can put a lot of pressure on those backpack hooks. I mean, a tremendous amount of use, and they're guaranteed not to bend or break. Are they DSA approved? They are definitely, everything on this project is DSA approved. <laughs> okay. All right, and then the last slide um, for this in, within the project update, um, as we wanted just to kind of give you some ideas of some things that we, um, as, as a district and um, started, you know, as we had an opportunity to work on multiple projects now, um, some of our preferences from product to programs um, to some lessons or just things that have helped us be more efficient um, on, on projects. Um, so from the standpoint of products, um, we've now come down to the, to the realization that using a carpet tile versus a, a whole roll of carpet is much more efficient and effective for us. Um, and we, in our custodial staff in particular, uh, well, in the teaching staff really appreciates this because if, it, if a carpet got stained or it started to have a, a crease in it or something like that, um, you could do your best to clean out that, that stain or, or reduce that, that, that um, crease, but it's really difficult, as you know, when it's in a roll format. So now then with the tile, we just have to pop the tiles out and put the new tile in and it looks brand spanking new on that. Um, HVAC units, we're now standardizing our units as we move from one site to the other. Um, and this is increasing our efficiency as, as well as our utilization and our way, ability to control the units. So we don't have multiple, um, we still have multiple platforms throughout the district, but we're slowly but surely coming down into to one unit. Um, and then we've also standardized our furn furnishings from interior um, and exterior, the things that we're gonna see standardized from one site um, to the other. So exterior, we've standardized our paint. So where we have, um, we don't have multiple colors happening at multiple sites. Um, we have essentially two main bait, two main bodies, um, some trim, and then we do allow a little bit of personalization from a site um, with, a, with another part of the trim. Um, but other than that, it's, they have to pick from the bodies so that we, that uh, we present um, to them. Anything to add on that, Kelly, on a product preferences? Um, on the exterior site furnishings, we've honed down on a very inexpensive and durable exterior bench that we are working using at many of our projects. So these are all the things that we're just like Mike said that we're adding um, as we go and making sure we're using saving money and um, also kind of relieving headaches at the maintenance side. So 
yeah, I think that's about it. Under program space needs, um, so we're you know looking at under making sure that for our kinder classrooms that we're following the CDE recommendations um, that they have outlined as far as the size and the needs of kinder classrooms. And what um, does I'm sorry, when, can you explain that acronym, please, Mike? Uh, which the kinder or the CDE? CDE. Uh, California Department of Education. Okay, got it. Kinder, um, I sort of got, but yeah, no, I know. That's why I was kind of wondering. Appreciate which it. One. Appreciate it. <laughs> under, Thanks. In in uh and uh, for stages, um, we we did a lot. Of, we we reflected on some of the expenses we have spent on on a permanent stage structures and carving out what that looks like versus a stage structure that you saw in this particular um, slide show at, at Napa Junction. And we have, have landed on it. That's a more appropriate use of, of, of uh, taxpayer money uh, instead of having um, a very large, robust, uh, expensive stage um, that involves multiple um, things to have to have to occur. We decided that it's better to have a, a more a portable like stage um, for at the elementary level to serve the needs of that. Uh, particular um, age group, and then at the, in the administration offices too, um, we've settled on you know kind of have a standardized site as a site a size of uh, administrative offices uh, administrative office that we need um, front office as well as the types of offices that the school sites uh, need for as it says pull out spaces and things like that uh, at their offices. Kelly, anything to add on program space? No, I think that's it. And then on lessons learned from the finishing the fourth campus. Um, so from a scheduling standpoint, it just, it, you just get, I mean, I'll just be straight with everybody. You know, my, my learning curve has been extremely steep since I accepted this position three years ago. Um, and so um, from my standpoint, I've, I've gotten much better at, at making sure we're keeping on track and keeping our schedule, um, you know, uh, in, a, in a positive direction and not falling behind schedule uh, on the projects as, as well. Um, and so my level of management has become has has grown e each each year, maybe to the chagrin of Van Pelt, maybe not. I don't know, uh, but <laughs> hopefully, hopefully they've appreciated. Glad my, to have the help. Uh, hopefully they've, they've appreci appreciated my uh, doggedness on, on that. Um, in addition, we've had regular scheduled district site walks. So I set up appointments so that I'm on that site. I was on that site weekly, if not more often, but at least once a week I was on weekly. Uh, I walked with a Van Pelt uh, employee, and that was typically Ray Green, but sometimes Kelly was there. Um, but it was either Kelly or Ray Green. Um, we walked the site and brought me up to date. If necessary, I, I met with the, with um, Lathrop representatives um, or the or the contractor in charge of that, which was uh, Bruce Reynolds, I believe is his name, um, and we would meet with him. Um, on the move coordination, what we mean by that is how we're coordinating uh, moving from one site to the other. So it, it may seem simple, but it is really not very simple to move the whole school with all the staff from one site to the other. Um, and we've gotten a much more efficient uh, in making those moves happen between, you know, uh, and, and the coordination, to, um, it, sort of, it leads to the next bullet between the custodians and the maintenance, as well as Van Pelt and the, move, and the movers that are hired to move all, all the entities to the next place. Um, building on that though, we have increased our frequent, or, or we've increased our um, communication between our custodial and maintenance departments with MAP, MVSD and with Van Pelt. Um, and I think we have a really, uh, you know, we don't have to say to each other, did you check with the director of maintenance? Did you check with the director of operations? Or did you check with Van Pelt? It's already, it's kind of in our ingrained in our brain that we need to be checking with each other uh, when we're talking about these new projects or in, in, in whether it's the new school at Napa Junction or it's uh, the, the modernization um, at Alta Heights that occurred recently. As and you're well talking too. about the, during the programming stage, right? I'm talking about from the start, start to the finish, mm -hmm. start to the finish, as well as the one, the, 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 the warranty period. So even a year beyond, um, we really want a high level of communication happening the, amongst the, amongst the, amongst the two entities, because I do not want, um, and I made it really clear. I don't want Van Pelt to say, okay, we're done managing. You take over Napa Valley, you know, and we have had no communication. Uh, for, for the year of the project or whatever length of the project happens to be, and as well as the warranty period, and we've had no interaction with that. So we have a high degree of communication. Um, we've, we go as far as involving other employees beyond Albert D'Souza, who's the director of, of maintenance, and Gloria Aguirre, who's the director of, of operations. We involve, we involve employees um, at, in various trades to be on site at times, um, and from the landscaping um, to 
HVAC to electrical plumbing. Um, and then sometimes we involve the custodial staff as well too. Not, that, not as often as the maintenance staff with that. Um, working with city officials, um, we certainly have, you know, have had our, our, our you know, times, you know, not, I don't want to say struggles, but challenges <laughs> working with city officials. Um, but I think we've gotten, we found it, a, you know, a good sweet spot on who's going to take which role um, to get things uh, through. Um, and so sometimes that role is, I played that role. Sometimes Rob Manguel has played that role. Sometimes the Van Pelt employees have, have played that role, uh, depending on, uh, played a, a role. And, and we interchangeably, we sometimes interchange our roles, but we always have a pre-planning meeting on that to, to make sure that we're moving this, these projects along in a, in a timely manner um, with the cities and, and, and having good coordination uh, with them. And then, as I said earlier about our traffic control, um, we did a really nice job. Um, we've learned at each, each, each site, we, each new site we've opened up, uh, how to get better at the traffic control. So it's, we're, we've got, we're a pretty well-oiled machine. We won't be, uh, you know, knock on wood, hopefully we don't have to build new schools anymore. Um, but if we do have to build new schools again, we're, we're, we've really have got a good process in place. And who knows, maybe we'll go to the cash academy or something like that and have someone ask us what we did, because I think it's a pretty well-oiled machine. Uh, Kelly, anything to add on lessons learned? Um, no, I think that's about it. All right. Um, so Mike, any, any, you, any questions about the project? Did you find uh, the local jurisdiction, i.e. the city officials, were more difficult, more challenging? I shouldn't say difficult. Um, whatever word we want to use, more nuanced to deal with than the state or... Um, I think they both present their challenges in, to be um, in different ways. In different ways, yeah. Right. And they, they they all have. I think they all have, um, a, you know, particular interests at heart. Uh, and I understand that. Um, but you know, our job is to get through those, get all, get through that because we need this project to occur in a timely manner, so it doesn't keep dragging on, so we don't incur extra expenses. Um, but we also need to comply with the regulations that the state and the city um, have, uh, would like us to comply with as well, too. Fair enough. Um, and then, I, so this is the fourth new campus. So I'm assuming Willow was the first? Willow, then Snow, then River. Okay. And Napa Junction, round us out. Okay. Okay, so the takeaway from this is um, standardizing processes and procedures and uh, materials and equipment to make future um, OPEX and CAPEX more cost effective. Absolutely. Okay. Anyone have any questions or comments on project updates? Barb? I, let me see if I'm, I just want to say the campus looks beautiful um, and definitely what a great place for the kids and teachers they must be over the moon um and i am really proud of that i think that's a really good good place for kids and um napa junction has struggled in the past and they have a, a beautiful site and that that's i'm proud to know that we were able to do that i i really one of the things i heard mike say loud and clear which i think is an, another piece that has made some of this a little work a little more efficient than it's been in the past is the like, communication with all of the people involved and um, the district being present during the building uh, process um, the coordination of the different groups make being on the same page you know you kelly maintenance the district so everyone sort of working together i think it is oh, just like you've said here lessons learned from finishing a fourth new campus and that is um it's really nice work really nice work yeah what a I unique opportunity yeah, yeah. What I lacked in my knowledge of construction, I made up for my uh, my knowledge in systems. Yeah. <laughs> so, Mike, can I ask a clarifying question? Yes. Prior, sir. prior to you, uh, it sounds like people didn't make a regular. The district didn't make a regular tour of their facilities. Is that right? Um, I would say. Well, the, see the the. The interesting part around this is I do believe Don was was on campus on a on a pretty regular basis, but he was a contract. He was a he wasn't a district employee. He con he was a um, uh, um, 
I don't want to say a con it wasn't a contract, but he was he he was uh what's the word consultant. I'm looking for? A consultant, thank you. Mm -hmm. He was a consultant, but because he had been in the district for as long as he had, he was just viewed upon as the district's as a district employee, if that makes sense. Sure. Um, and so so I mean, I could say you're right, but I would all but I could also argue that you're that it's not that you're wrong, that 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 Don did represent the district and that he was a district employee, but it, it, technically he wasn't he was a consultant and so he wasn't a district employee for for several of the you know several years yeah. le ba leading back to to unfortunately his his untimely death but I, I i've been was on the other last bond issue as well and and don was on campus all the time the, the difference was is a lot of the people that he had working for him were his age and they're not and they they were gone by the time he was gone as well i think I that's part of the problem yeah, and I, I would I would add to that that um, it it what also whether it's you know one person's part in the game or not I think one of the things that that has changed is not just that Mike personally Mike Pearson walks a site but that he encourages the other folks in his organization to do the same and communicate with the construction side which I think when I know when I arrived was something that wasn't as happening as regularly as it maybe could have been as far as um, you know, I think Albert D'Souza's and, and Gloria um, Aguirre's involvement in the projects and even the folks that work for them, that involvement is more robust just from the example that's being set. It, it was that pretty, makes sense. It, yeah, it was pretty limited, their involvement at all. Yeah. Yeah. And it was <laughs> clear to me that they had not had they, they shared a frustration of not being more involved. Um, and and then, con, con, you know, consequently, there was finger pointing that would come, you know, would, would, you would have coming up. And I don't like finger pointing. I don't think it's effective. I don't think it's helpful. So we changed that so that there's no finger pointing. And we wanted to make sure that everybody had, had, had a knowledge base that was equivalent to, you know, I shouldn't say equivalent, but a, a fairly strong knowledge base of what was happening at the projects and, and what their level of involvement uh, was. So we would, you know, for instance, we made a, a decision at, uh, I believe it's snow to go with a polished concrete uh, flooring in the multi-purpose room. But we did that after we had consultation with Gloria, the uh, Gloria Aguirre, our director of operations, and how that would affect her 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 custodial crew. Was that a good choice? Was it a bad choice? And and they she was one hundred percent supportive of it because it increases their efficiency in cleaning that that particular flooring. So then we used that flooring at other locations because of that that conversation we had with her. I. I I don't believe those kind of conversations happened in the past based on what I've heard, you know, from my, from the people I oversee. Well, it, I, it improves I, our projects. There's no doubt. Sure. I, I yeah. mean, I'm coming from construction. I mean, Kevin can, you know, tell you what it's like having the other owners representatives go through their, you know, project sites. But I, I think, you know, one, I, I'm glad to hear that you guys identified that and, and you addressed it and you're getting out there and doing it. But also the way that you worded it earlier, uh, it made me think that that wasn't happening on a regular basis. So I was kind of uh, concerned isn't the right word, but it was something that uh, that threw a yellow flag in my mind since it's football season. Yeah, I mean, prior to me, prior to me yeah. taking on. OK, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to allude to that. No, there was definitely uh, oh, there was definitely um, Don definitely had his boots on the ground at, at the okay. sites. Cool. Uh, yep. Yep, Mike. Uh, Don actually knew what he was doing and you didn't. So you had to get people. I'm, I'm, I'm much better, Richard. Damn, that was a that. shot across I'm the much, bow. That's all right. That wasn't, I can, even, I, that wasn't even across the bow. I can take it. Like I said, I'm, I'm good at okay. managing and I'm good at putting in systems in place. All right. So let me, let me bring it back, Richard. Thank you. Uh, with one final question. When's so the opening? when's the opening? Well, we're going to get to that slide in a second. So let's have Kevin ask this question um, and then we'll go to the next sorry, slide. One, one final question. Uh, for Kelly and uh, Mike, uh, from from a schedule back to scheduling, right? From uh, the tools you guys utilized, uh, was it just CPM scheduling, or were, was there any other any other processes that were utilized? You know, I, I asked that question in the context of um, you know this campus Napa Junction and keeping it on track. Um, yeah, so uh, CPM scheduling or, or for the rest of the group, critical path uh, method scheduling um, is what the contractor uses. So, uh, it, you know, it, it's funny that you mentioned schedule because Mike and I just had a meeting about bond schedule earlier today. Um, you know, the schedules that we put together for the district on the program level are pretty simplistic. Um, you, you know, it's going to have, you know, 
five to seven milestones for a project. Um, and we review those on a very high level. When we get to the point where we're working with a contractor, we're doing a, a CPM schedule that is going to have literally on a project this side, thousands of activities um, from, you know, hanging signage on doors to pouring concrete to things like that. So the way that that gets reviewed um, on our projects is um, the contractor submits a baseline schedule. Sorry, Kevin, I'm going the long way, but I want to make sure I set a little bit of context yeah, for everybody. It. Yep. Um, contractor submits a baseline schedule for the project that meets his contractual obligations. Um, and then our team reviews that. They either say, yep, this is great. Let's go for it. Or you have some flawed logic. You have some items that don't seem to make sense. And you have a meeting and you discuss those and try to understand why they did it the way they did it. Maybe they make some changes. Maybe we agree and we come to an agreement. And that is called the baseline for that very reason. It sets the baseline for the rest of the project. Any changes that they make to their critical path method schedule during the course of the project have to be documented and submitted once a month when it comes time to review their billing, our project managers also review their schedule. We look at it and see, are they on schedule? Are they behind? Are they ahead of schedule? How are we tracking? And again, we review any changes that they have made to the schedule to see how they fit in and whether they're, you know, for lack of a better term, lawful or logical. Um, you know, you can't just change things because you want it. Um, so that is really the process that we use is a minimum of a monthly review as we, um, review pay applications. We like to tie those things together because people like to get paid. So they like to get us an updated schedule that makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, then we have to have some conversations until it does. And Kevin, to build on that, we, Kelly and I and Ray have a weekly meeting. And if they need to bring up schedule, they will bring it up. And if, they, if it's a, a situation that the district needs to get involved and I do get involved, I know about important milestones, like the ones Kelly said, the big ones. But all the ones that the minute the, the 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 smaller ones, the ones that comprise you know those big ones, um, I don't necessarily take you know ownership of those. That's that's why we have uh, Kelly and Ray and the and the Van Pelt Corporation to do that. Right, right, but on the right, important right. milestones, we hold firm to that. And if those milestones start start to have, have it, we have issues with those particular dates, then uh, then I get involved. And that is something that we review on you know I don't know, on a yeah, they'd say on a weekly basis and when the yeah. projects are kicking off and then when they start to move in a, moving in a positive direction, then we may not review the schedule as much. We may review more other things in pertinent to that particular project at that time of year, whatever's going on. But somebody like Ray Green, who's our senior project manager, um, you know, spent 20 some odd years as a superintendent um, for a general contractor before his 10 plus years of working with us on the CM side. Um, so he really looks for, you know, for tactics. He looks for issues, things that don't make sense in the schedule, um, because those can really um, shine a light on problems that might be occurring in the project that you may not see until the last minute unless you're looking closely as I, I know Jason and Kevin know very well. Okay, all right, good. Thank you for that. All right, so on to our next slide. So to speak to what Richard's question was, we have, uh, today we actually sent out postponements on the uh, grand opening, which we were going to have on the, the 15th at 5.30, but um, just out of a abundance of caution, you know, with, with um, you know, what's happening with COVID, uh, we just feel it's a better, better chance in, in wanting to, wanting to make sure that we could have a robust audience there. Um, we felt it was better to, to postpone this for to a later date. Um, we had, it was, it just was just a better, it's just a better uh, uh, opportunity for us. We know that, um, that people, that, that people in the American Canyon community really want to come out and want to celebrate this new school. And we didn't want to, we didn't want to have to limit it to a certain number of, of individuals. Um, and so we felt it was better to postpone at this point. And then we'll have it, uh, uh, we'll, we do want to have that grand opening, but we want to have it at a point where we can have a remote, hopefully a remote, more robust grand opening. Um, so that will be coming down the road. Should be something to celebrate. So, okay. Yeah. Thank you for that uh, addition. No, it should be something to celebrate. You got to celebrate your victories, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so that was our first item under old business, item number eight on our agenda. Item number two on old business, uh, there was a question and some discussion at last meeting, at the last meeting uh, concerning demographics and enrollment trends. Um, we, Kelly, we provided a graphic of that uh, in everyone's folder or in the, um, 
in the meeting folder for today. So that is available for everyone to peruse. Um, and if we want to have any further discussion on that, we can uh, agenda size that for an upcoming meeting. I, I have I have a comment about that, if I could. No. Uh, do you realize that Oakland City Schools has has a student population of thirty seven thousand? That's all. That's all their school system has. And and the reason I because in New Orleans they said there were forty four thousand students out. I said these these cities are five times the size of us, six times the size of us, and they only have that many students. I I just found that curious. Okay. Have you, been, have you been in New Orleans? Yeah, I've been in New Orleans. But I mean, but Oakland's only 37,000. I mean, 30, Oakland has 32 charter schools. Yeah. They do have a lot, of, but they only have 37,000 students in their whole student body. Anyway, whatever that's worth. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that, Richard. I looked it up. Okay. okay. I didn't know it. We we will note your uh, your command of the uh, of Google Wikipedia, buddy. <laughs> okay, Wikipedia. Okay, okay. So new business. Um, I think that's it for old business. New business. Um, so um, we are going to endeavor to uh, get the twenty twenty. One 2022 annual report submitted um, in March to it's, the- It's actually, sorry, just to be clear, it's the 2021 annual report. This is where it gets funky. The, you're right, you're right. The 21-22 no, yeah, is the fiscal yeah. year we're in right now. Thank you for that. Um, so we're gonna endeavor to get the 2020-2021 annual report to the board in March because Mike has promised me that if we do that, um, it'll happen before midnight <laughs> on the day of the meeting. It'll happen on March 17th, not March 18th. There you go. <laughs> and just for everybody's edification, there might be fermented beverages involved with this bet. So <laughs> this is true. Um, so that means that the um, next meeting, in addition to regular reoccurring topics, such as uh, a review of expenditures and high level project updates will include, um, you know, an early discussion of the format um, and groups of content of the report. So sort of like what we did, I believe in the March meeting this past year, where we went through essentially everything but the specific comments. If I recall correctly, I believe that was the March meeting. And then uh, in January, right, we have been promised that the auditor will be able to provide us the uh, audit in advance of that meeting and will be available for that meeting. We will review the audit at that meeting. And in typical Kevin fashion, we're biting off a lot to chew at that meeting and we'll work on finalizing the report. Okay. Um, so as my boss Ozzy tells me, you better have a plan. It may not be the right plan, but as long as you have a plan, you'll be okay. So that is the plan. Uh, in in the interest of getting out ahead of this for this coming year. And can I just add a couple things, Kevin? Uh, uh, you may, yes. One thing is it's predicated on making sure we get the audit done in a timely manner. So if we don't, you know, last year it was delayed because of COVID. If it's, if it, if it happens like it should, it, we should have, it, we should be able to meet this date. The other thing, just to give the committee members an, um, an overview or an, an idea is that the superintendent sat down earlier this year and, and sort of calendared out all the meetings, that, all of our board meetings and the presentations that would occur at these meetings, because we were cognizant of the fact that it, the meeting Kevin referenced uh, earlier this year and other meetings, the meetings went rather very, very long, and we wanted to try to avoid that at, at all possible. So it was, um, it was we when in looking at the dates, this was this was the best date uh, that would that would fit for for the uh, bond oversight committee uh, to present their annual um, review of the, of, of the annual report and, and a review of the audit um, at this particular meeting on the seventeenth of March. Okay. Any questions or commentary on the? Preliminary plan for the annual report? Nope, looks good. Okay. Um, and the plan is for future meetings relative to a review of expenditures to essentially follow this format. 
and um, you know, do a deep financial dive of specific projects um, rather than a superficial high level view. Open to thumbs up, thumbs down on that. Um, if anybody has any comments, um, please raise your hands now or you know, provide them to us afterwards. Okay, I will take everyone's silence as everyone thinking that's a great idea. All right, next meeting is November 10th at 4.30. Um, so just to recap today's meeting, right? We, uh, we focused obviously, Richard, can you guess which school we focused on today? <laughs> uh, Napa Junction, I think Napa. You no, know, and your wife tells me you're slow. Yes, no, we focused today on Napa Junction both in the uh, financials as well as the project um, updates. If I'd known there'd be a quiz, I'd have taken notes, Kevin. Don't worry, I'm gonna send you your own personalized quiz later, Thank Richard. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, all right. Um, anybody have any future agenda items they would like to present at this time? Okay, with that, uh, unless anyone has any parting comments. Yeah, make sure you send us those uh, phone numbers, if you please. Kelly, please send us the phone numbers. You got it. Thank you. Okay. Richard, do you have any other requests? <laughs> yeah, but not here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you for some level of restraint. All right, it is 5.58, folks. And we're gonna call the meeting. Everyone have a great rest of your Wednesday and we'll see you here on November 10th. Thanks Thank very you, much. Everyone. Bye -bye. Thanks everybody. Thanks. 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 Thanks.